Well, good morning. My name is Alice Hill, and I am a proud graduate of the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative. Uh, and it's really a delight uh, to have a chance to talk to these two superstars about leadership. Uh, I think that uh, Lenny uh, and Eric may be well known to each of you through their roles in leading the National Preparedness Leadership uh, Initiative, NPLI, at Harvard University, as well as their roles at the Public School of Health at Harvard. But we're going to be talking to them today about their co-authorship of a remarkable book, a wonderful title, You're It, Crisis Change and How to Lead When It Matters Most. Now, I know that some of you are aware that Lenny and Eric have firsthand accounts of watching leaders during times of crisis make the decisions that can turn a crisis in uh, multiple directions. Uh, they've been uh, on the ground uh, at Katrina, BP oil spill, Boston Marathon bombings, and many other incidents. And they've taken all of that learning and ideas and put it into a wonderful uh, read for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it yet, about how do people lead successfully. So I want to uh, turn this over to them. Uh, my first question is about the title. How did you come up with the title, You're It? Well, we were um, sitting around. And we don't even remember exactly when and where, but remember, we remember how it came out, that, that we were um, thinking about the individual people that we had met, and we started playing with titles. And one of the people we spoke to about that was Thad Allen. And we said to Admiral Thad Allen, of course, was Commandant of the Coast Guard. He was the National Incident Commander for the Gulf oil spill. And he took over from Mike Brown during Hurricane Katrina, which is when I met him. Um, he walked into the office of the leader. I just happened to be in the office. He said to me very gruffly, who are you? Uh, and which is how that speaks. And, um, and I introduced myself. And I didn't think he was paying attention. And he listened to every word. And um, the idea of somebody coming into a situation like that um, and being it, because that, when he walked in during Katrina, of course, Mike Brown had just been relieved of duties by mm -hmm. Secretary Chertoff, uh, really was it. And everybody was looking for him to somehow pull together the morale, pull together the response. Similarly, during uh, the Gulf oil spill, he was it. And um, he was communicating with BP. He was communicating with the president. And during one of those you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations that, he, 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 that we had, he was talking about how the president was going around castigating uh, BP. And uh, his words to me were, not helpful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Because he said, we need BP as the ally. They've got all the technology. And so you know, Thad and a number of other people clearly were in this position of having enormous responsibility. And then as we um, observed leaders in other scenarios as well, we recognized that they had enormous responsibility, that they were either going to fly with and make things incredible happen, mm -hmm. or they were going to retreat from. And of course, I was with Mike Brown during Katrina, and he was in a difficult position and then retreated. So this notion of being it um, arose for us early on. And then um, it was a little bit of a play on words because our first reaction was, you're it, that's a ch child's game. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. um, and then we recognized it also has that double meaning of being a one person and being multiple persons. And how do you create the multiple people? So that's how, that's how we sort of came to that name. And I think you know that talks about looking back at sort of that that moment. But as we've, the book has come out and we've we've been sharing it with people, the title has resonated because there seems to be a great hunger for, for leaders and those in in leadership positions, to step up and take accountability. Uh, and when when people look to you, you can't just hide, you can't run away, you can't close the door and wish they would go away. You actually have to stand up and be it. 
and that's what it means to lead. And uh, you know, we look at the uh, I was looking at the front page of the Wall Street Journal yesterday, and it was the uh, tankers on fire uh, in the Gulf. It was Facebook having a crisis. It was Google having a crisis. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think it's a lot, there's a real cry for people to step up and be and be it. And uh, so that's I think it's a great resonance going forward. It, it, it's also testament to everybody in the room because um, um, just looking around, we all know who we are. There have been a number of one-on-one -on -one conversations. I remember conversations where you were at the NAC or in the White House. Similarly, conversations at the ODNI and conversations at FEMA with a lot of people in the room. And you were it and um, mm -hmm. had enormous responsibility uh, with Daryl during the inauguration of, first inauguration of President Obama, we were reflecting on last night, that you allowed us to watch mm -hmm. you being it. And for that, we are enormously grateful because what we feel that we've done is taken the stories and the lessons learned from this collection of extraordinary people who took the responsibility, who became it. Right. And even if they didn't use that word, it was really clear that they were living with the burden of either knowing something or having to make a decision about something and finding the challenges of doing that. It wasn't easy. Um, and sometimes even facing uh, resistance that could create some bad press for them. But they were doing the right thing. And um, each of those people assumed this responsibility knowing that I'm it or that we're it. And that was part of what was inspiring for us as well. I mean, this is the story of the NPLI mm -hmm. as much as it is the story of any particular leader. One of the things I love about the title is that sometimes you're not choosing to be it, mm -hmm. but you have to recognize that, as in the children's mm -hmm. game, you're tagged. Uh, it's your responsibility now. So um, really appreciate it, uh, all aspects of that. Why this book right now? You know, I, I think that. <laughs> We are in a world that does not lack for turbulence, and all of you know that. Um, and we are looking for people to step forward and help us find some footing, <clears throat> excuse me, find some islands of calm. And that's what effective leaders do. Um, and that's why I think, you know, Lenny reflected this is the story of the MPLI. And I, what, part of what I hope this does and gives confidence to, to the general public is that there's an enormous cadre of people, and you are among them, who have trained to make us safer and more resilient, who have dedicated your careers to finding the problem, finding the solutions to complex problems, to being ready to be it when the worst thing happens. Um, and being able to get those stories out there now, I think, will be something the public will, will resonate with them and hopefully build confidence. Because as I say, it's, it's the, the great joy of doing this work is to get to meet people who are in the book, those of you who are in the room with us this morning, because you do it. You've stepped up and been it when it's been tough. And uh, people need to appreciate that and understand all that it takes. Um, people have told us that uh, we're in a growth industry. This goes for everybody in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. In crisis leadership. Um, I th the, the reason now, in my mind, is that we're in a time when leaders are shirking their responsibility. So if we just look at a few of the very, very high profile leadership stories that are resonating, such as Boeing, uh, which is shirking its responsibility. Other countries grounded the plane well before ours did. And Boeing was still trying to mm -hmm. keep the plane flying uh, well, well after it should have been grounded. And so that was a crisis of leadership. And there's so many other um, examples where leaders walk away from responsibility. They'll either try and blame somebody else, or they'll um, simply assume, let's just keep doing what we're doing. It'll be OK. And so right now, for a whole series of reasons, and without getting into politics, uh, we're at also a crisis of leadership. It's not only that leaders are leading through crisis. It's a crisis of leadership, where I think leaders are perplexed about what is my responsibility. And so what we're saying in the book is you are responsible. You are it. Uh, whether you like it or not, you cannot run away from being it. And we hope that that resonates um, 
uh, because it's time that leaders be accountable for the decisions that they're making and the actions that they're taking, and more so than ever before, even in climate change. Mm -hmm. We need people to <clears throat> take that responsibility. So, Yeah, I, I think that we, I hope that people who read this book walk away and realize that leading is a verb. It's not a merit badge you get and you stick on your lapel and that means you're always a leader. Le you have to do something. You actually have to provide direction, solve problems, get people motivated and, and pull them together. You actually have to do stuff. And I hope that we stop calling people in leadership positions leaders just because they sit in a certain office. <clears throat> it's based on what you do. It's the behaviors you exhibit. Are you leading or are you not leading? And we hope that inspires more people to do it. So much of your <clears throat> book and uh, your work is about leaders who may not have the formal title of uh, head or director <clears throat> or whatever, uh, but in fact uh, mm -hmm. are called upon to lead. And you have some uh, wonderful interviews uh, before and after crises of various people who've been in those positions. What are particular favorites for you or meaningful uh, anecdotes that you can share with us? So I, I want to share one that actually, because those of you who've been through the MPLI, you know the Deepwater Horizon story. You know the Boston Marathon story. Um, one of my favorites is with a gentleman named Budge Upton who was the fourth project manager for the renovation of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. You think, what crisis is that? Well, he was the fourth project manager because the first three failed. It was a highly visible project with a fixed deadline, a fixed budget, a high-powered mayor, a high-powered board, a celebrity architect, multiple mm -hmm. unions, craftspeople who came from overseas who didn't speak any English. Uh, and oh, by the way, it's a priceless collection of art. You have to keep the museum open, the old part of the museum open, throughout the entire project, so like nothing can go wrong. And Budge did this amazing job, I and mean, he was present, he was visible on the job. He figured out how to wield influence with, as I say, wealthy donors who wanted things done a certain way, a celebrity ar architect with a big ego, with the unions who had their issues, to keep all the pieces moving. So they did it, if you, when you come to Boston, you should visit, it's a great uh, addition to the museum. But it did open on time, it did open on budget, and it was a great sort of one of those untold stories, again, of people who are working sort of behind the scenes. No one knows this guy's name, uh, aside from those in, in, in that world, um, but who pulled off an, an incredible feat of leadership under uh, a lot of pressure. So it's a, not a real crisis in the terms of people weren't going to die, um, but I think it's a really interesting example of someone who was able to yield great influence beyond his authority and figure out how to bring people together who had very divergent interests to complete a, an amazing project. How about you, Lenny? So um, there, there were a lot of fun parts about writing the book. One of them was the stories of people that we had met along the way. And um, so to ask which was your favorite story is like saying which is your All favorite right. child. Yeah. Right. <laughs> however, modify the question however okay, you like however, it. Mm -hmm. There was, there was one story that was a bit of a leap for us, and it, it, it turned out to be a marvelous experience, and so we tried to chronicle that story in the book, and that was a year ago. Um, so we always hold the NPLI in December and June, and we tell people in December if there's a crisis between now and June, whoever was a leader in that crisis uh, will come back and tell us about their experience, and many times... Um, uh, there are people in the class who led through the Gulf oil spill or Billy Evans led through Boston Marathon bombing. So it turns out we have people in the class who, who played extraordinary roles in, in crises in the interim. So uh, a, a year ago, it was the Park Lawn school shootings. Mm -hmm. And through somebody who is a survivor of the Boston Marathon, we had a connection to one of the young people that was a survivor in, in the school. And uh, we invited her Eden Hebron, 15 years old at the time, and her mother, to come up and speak to the June class. We were extraordinarily nervous, not that she wouldn't present well, but we wanted to be sensitive to her feelings sure. and her emotions. Yeah. You know, here's a 15-year-old speaking mm -hmm. to a Harvard, and you know, we were at the Harvard Law School, so mm -hmm. this big Harvard uh, classroom, imposing. yeah, uh, to a group of, you know, older people, um, um, and so it's a pretty overwhelming experience to talk about what for her was a tragedy. Um, so Eden um, and her mother were in front of the classroom 
And we were as gentle and sensitive to her as we could have been, and she was incredible. And she told us the story of what happened. Mm -hmm. And basically, she was in the first classroom uh, where the shooter started. And so there are, I think, six or seven students who died in that classroom, including her best friend, who was about mm -hmm. three feet away. And she recounted the whole story extraordinarily sensitively. Um, and what she mm -hmm. said is something went off in her mind that she should cover herself, that if he can't see her, he can't shoot her. So she covered herself with a piece of paper so that she was hidden, and she could see that people right next to her were being shot, um, and she survived. Um, and when she was done telling the story, and of course we've learned more about this through the press uh, as well, she gave such a lecture to the law enforcement people in our classroom about they're not fulfilling the responsibility. Mm -hmm. And of course we now know that there was a school uh, uh, right. uh, officer who didn't go into the building, um, she talked about what happened when the, the police eventually did come in. She gave an extraordinarily articulate um, analysis of what law enforcement didn't do. And she turned to the class and she said, and you need to do it. A 15-year-old mm. um, um, lecturing law, senior law enforcement people, we have people from Mass State Police, from a lot of federal agencies, Boston Police, etc., lecturing them on what they need to do to change their community was extraordinarily moving. And um, it's, it's one of the moving stories because we watched her leadership grow right in the classroom. And we watched her assert herself. And it was really clear, speaking of resilience, that she wasn't going to be taking, taken down by mm -hmm. her experience. She was going to be taken up by mm -hmm. her experience. Mm -hmm. And of course, in keeping with uh, what Eric just said, we define leadership as people follow you. And everybody in the room was moved to tears. And mm -hmm. people raised their hand and said to Eden, I will do what you've asked us to do because wow. we owe it to you. So that was very, very moving. And because she wasn't uh, an expected leader, she wasn't in a mm -hmm. position uh, where we would have expected her to lead, to see her in some ways blossom right in front of us was very, very exciting. And we will be following up with both Mass State Police and Boston Police that they were going to change their, their protocols and procedures based on her remarks. And we're going to see those folks on Monday, and I'm going to make sure they have done that so we can share it with everyone. Um. Uh, well, that is an inspirational story about how uh, people do um, respond in crisis in a leadership manner. In writing this book, uh, and you both have been thinking about leadership for a number of years. Did you have any aha moments where it clicked for you that you uh, had new insights into leadership? Uh, or is this a matter really that you just uh, distilled and filtered uh, the many lessons that you've learned over the years? You know, I, I think it, it actually made us work really hard and push deeper, even on things we have been teaching for years and, and thought we, oh, we take that for granted. Um, so I think both reflecting on the stories and collecting the stories and figuring out which ones, we, which we could have included them all. It would have been a very large book, um, too, too large to carry. But distilling which stories were we going to include and then which things were missing, where were we, you know, Eden and Brown, finding, finding that story, the budge up, and some of the things that were, uh, making sure the, book, the, the lessons were relevant to as broad an audience as possible, um, that really pushed us. And then there were, some, you know, there were some new things. Those of you who went to the program a few years ago, uh, we had this whole notion of driving to the knowns, which we had started with an idea that as a leader in a crisis, you know a little bit. And you probably know the first four or five questions you're going to ask to try and figure out what you know you don't know. But then what happens next? Do you push beyond that or do you stop? And we have seen... Uh, people really get stuck because they didn't reach out to a subject matter expert, let's say, or connect with another agency that knew things they could have known. And where you're going to get, you know, look after the Boston Marathon, where did they uh, get in trouble with Congress? Well, you should have known those guys were there. Um, it was in, in intelligence someplace. And so this notion of driving to the nodes and getting more systematic about how you always push forward and ask questions, that was one that we, we had taught it a couple of times and we have a Somebody actually coming to teach next week from Schlumberger, Jim Andrews, who some of you work with. And every time we present it, I presented it multiple times with them, he'd say, I know that makes sense, but I can't figure out why that makes sense. But really pushed us to think, and we 
spent a lot of time back and forth arguing in the office. Let's try and get this right. And then those of you who read it will tell us if we got it right. But it really has been a notion of pushing harder against all those concepts, even the core ones of the person, the situation, and connectivity. How do we really make sure they're relevant? And that's been, uh, that was, there was some ahas along the way there. You know, we wrote basically the curriculum when, for people who come up to the NPLI. So, so for those of you who've been through the NPLI, you'll see getting out of the basement, you'll see the cone in the cube, you'll see connectivity, and then you get to a certain point and um, the question is, what's missing? There's something that we haven't touched upon. And so in the second to the last chapter, so this is the last chapter of content, uh, it's about time. And um, that was the, a lot of thinking about if we put everything together, what does it equal? And um, the aha was that it equals time. It doesn't matter when you do it. It doesn't matter what you do as much as in a crisis when you do it. So, for example, we give a very, we start with a very concrete example. You're in a motor vehicle accident, there are a lot of injured people, um, an ambulance arrives. Um, the, the, the key point is when does the ambulance arrive? If it, if it arrives within a matter of four minutes, then lives are saved. If it comes within a matter of 40 minutes, then lives are lost. And so we started playing around with this notion of time and timing. And then we went back to everything else we had written in the book. And it turned out that time and timing was central to everything, though we hadn't necessarily pulled it out. For example, we talk about getting out of the basement uh, when you're leading in a crisis. Well, if you're, in, if you're it. Mm -hmm. You uh, can't stay there long. Yeah, you have to get out of the basement quickly. And that's what people said during the Boston Marathon bombings, that um, uh, especially the NPLI people, we said, well, well, what happened? And they said, well, I went to the basement. And like Billy Evans uh, uh, told us a story that he, he was the incident commander at the very end when they were capturing uh, uh, the younger brother. And, um, and he said he was at the end of the, run, of the driveway, right in front of the boat where the young man was. And he said, so there I'm standing there, and there is a Watertown police on one side, state police on the other side, and 150 people uh, at my back, all mm -hmm. with guns pointed at my back. And I said, well, Billy, what did you do? He said, well, I went to the basement. Uh, so people were familiar with this notion of getting to the basement, but what mm -hmm. they also told us was they had to get out of the basement really quickly because there were a lot of other people that were counting on them. So um, we started going through all the material and looking at what the time factor was, and then we're coming to the end of writing the book, and Harvey and Irma and Jose all happened, those hurricanes. And anybody who was involved in that response, you were, you were doing multiple responses, one on top of the other. So time turned out to be an important factor there. So first off, we talk in the book, in the second to the last chapter, about time as something that you can work with uh, when you're in a crisis. And the fact that different people are looking at time in very, very different ways. Um, and the other thing is then how do you organize yourself to think about time? So we introduced a tool. Because whenever we came up with an idea, we always had to put a tool next to it. Like, it's nice to have the idea, but what do you do with it? So we created a tool that we call the arc of time. That if you're in the middle of whatever it might be, um, you, know, you start out at point zero because a crisis just happened. And so now all of a sudden there's this, this flurry of activity, and it reaches this peak. And then with time, it starts to calm down. Mm -hmm. And so you're operating over an arc of time. Many times people think, well, I'm just uh, passive along that arc of time. Things happen and I'm passive. And what we did is we turned it around to say, you can actually be active. You can have some control about this arc of time in terms of the information you have, the information you give other people. Uh, when are things urgent? How do you act when things are urgent? What if it's not urgent? Then how do you act differently? So that what we do in that last chapter is pull it all together by saying getting out of the basement, the situational awareness, building that connectivity, all happens over time. And time is something that you can mold if you pay attention to it. And so that was one of the ahas that came as we were writing that we didn't have in the first outline of the book. 
So since you've written this, uh, have there been other moments you think, oh, I wish I had added that as well? There's a couple blank pages in the back of the book. I think we can keep adding. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Eric and everybody else is afraid that I'm going to continue doing that. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait. I put more things I want, I want to put, I want to yeah, put in right. there. <laughs> you know, that is a challenging thought. And I think one of, one of the really interesting things I learned going through this process, which took several years from the time we first thought about doing this, started drafting it, got it to a, even when you get it to a publisher and they say, great, we want it. You're still a year to 18 months away and several rounds of writing and editing and back and forth. Um, and then when it's finally, you know, it's done, you think, oh my God, what, what, what did we leave out? What, what's not there? Um, there's nothing that's glaring for me that we left out, although I know there's going to be the next crisis that hits. I'm going to say, oh, we didn't do enough about bio or we didn't talk about well, some specific threat or some sector or we'll meet somebody really interesting. And, uh, and want to pull, you know, pull it together. So um, I know we're already going to start thinking about the next book, which, I, Lenny, you can't talk about that till September. <laughs> we have a summer off, OK? Right, right. right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't know, did you have anything you left that, yeah. you wanted to leave, that you wanted to put in that we forced out? It, it, it's not that there's something that I wanted to put in. I just think we're living through really, really interesting times yeah. mm -hmm. without getting political. Mm -hmm. And um, having visited with you and many other people in this room who worked in the EELB and in the White House. Um, uh, and we continue visiting there because we're nonpartisan. So we mm -hmm. did, we did uh, a conference that was uh, opened by John Kelly when he was still the chief of staff. And, and there were all the political folks there. And we spoke about crisis leadership. So we are still determined to be nonpartisan and crisis leadership. And we think there's so many fascinating lessons that are being learned now about leadership. And I dropped off a copy of the book to Doug Fierce, who's the mm -hmm. uh, president's advisor on Homeland Security. And he, uh, you know, he, he's a man who's doing a lot of learning on the job and who is a tremendous service to the country uh, in the work that he's doing. So we think that there's a lot to be learned about l leading up now. Um, that could be a mayor. Uh, it could be a governor, it could be a president. And um, as we've spoken to people, the biggest problem that thematically seems to be in play is being true to yourself. Mm -hmm. Like people feel okay. that it's their patriotic duty to continue working in whatever the position might be, mm -hmm. um, running an agency, working in the White House. And the conversations we have as well, how then can you be true to yourself if you feel that you're being asked to do something or you're being part of implementing a policy that, you, that somehow violates your moral code. And uh, then how can you be true to yourself? So if there were to be another chapter in the book, um, that would be it. Because while it's glaring, given the politics that are going on right now, for some people, not everybody, um, um, it's, it's ever present. So uh, for everybody in the room, you always have that moment when you're being asked to do something or you have to do something because of the nature of the situation or you have to make a difficult decision about who's going to get vaccine or who not or how, what policy will we develop or what policy mm -hmm. are we going to hold off. And the question is, how do you be true to yourself? And I think that will be a chapter in a future book. Because there's a moral ethical dimension to everything that we're doing that's just a bit more glaring right now. Mm -hmm. And it's always there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say, if I can follow up on that, that one of the things, and again, those of you who are in or have been through the program recently, we did add uh, a speaker on ethical decision making that has been really, really interesting to get people. Because I think one of the things I've learned as you go through is that we can assume people, we used to assume that people had a certain some sort of grounding in ethical thinking, whether it came through school or your place of worship or whatever it was, you can't assume that anymore. People have to be making really high consequence decisions. They're doing the best they can, but you say, so why? What, what, what's your, what are your assumptions? What's your model? What, what, how are you prioritizing this? And they can't really articulate it. And that's a, that's a change societally over time. And so I think that that is, again, and. Chris Robichaud from the Kennedy School, who does that, has his own book coming out. So you'll get to not read it in ours, but read it in his. 
Uh, but it's been really interesting to see how, when you put people different generations together, um, different backgrounds, how they make those ethically challenging decisions is, is really complex. Because it's not as, as cut and dried as it once was. So I do want to open this up to questions, so, but I want to follow up on that as you think of your questions. Um, is there a generational difference between, um, say, the baby boomers and younger generations in leadership styles, uh, approaches? Yes, and we did our best to incorporate different voices in the book. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point, we said we've got voices on this topic, we have voices over here, and we didn't have the voices of younger people that we felt were important. Mm -hmm. um, so we interviewed a number of younger people. We interviewed women. Mm -hmm. uh, we interviewed people who look at leadership in very, very different ways, uh, where it's more communal, where it's far more, <coughs> it's not really hierarchical. Mm -hmm. It's um, very democratic. It's very collaborative. Um, they would rather make the decision by the right process than rather than getting the decision correct, that the process is more important than the outcome. And we felt that that line of thinking had to be incorporated as well. So there are a number of examples where people view connectivity uh, very differently. And I would say yes and no. So part of one of the exercises we did along the way was to do a series of focus groups with people who, digital natives, whether they were Gen Z or millennials, however you want to put them there, but digital natives. And they thought about things differently, but not in ways that were particularly surprising when you looked at the basic uh, milieu in which they operate. So if you think of my aging generation, um, I remember FM radio when you tune in at 9 o'clock and they would play like the new Steely Dan album all the way through. And that was like a big deal. You had to listen to the whole thing and one song to the next. Very linear and it was a whole... This generation grew up with playlists and Spotify and iTunes and you mix and match and you make it, you, you make, it's the remix generation as someone has called it. You make it your own. We bought a telephone once every 20 years. Now you buy a new phone every two years and by the way, some app is being updated on it pretty much constantly. And we talked to younger people who said, if I'm not constantly updating my skills, I'm falling behind, I'm getting out of date. So impatient to wait for the organization to say, yes, you can go to Harvard for a week. And so what are you going to do for me right now? Because I need to keep improving. So mm -hmm. there were some things that were, again, we look at them and say it's different, but they were <laughs> understandable given the, given the way, the, the, wor the world view they had, which is different than those of us who were baby boomers had. We have a, a new program, an emerging leaders program. So this is the younger crowd. <laughs> and so it had to fit the way they learn. So um, one day of that program is doing what essentially looks like a scavenger hunt in which they have to apply all the meta leadership tools to solving a whole series of clues that start on the Harvard Law School campus, go to Cambridge Commons, go through Harvard Square, uh, back into Harvard Yard, and ends up at the Science Center. Um, and, and baby boomers would like that too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it didn't. The five-hour challenge. It's not true. Yeah, it's it's, and they're all outside, and they're being evaluated by our students. Wow. And um, the intent is not to get the answers correct; it's to go through the process correctly. And it's fascinating. It was really um, based on looking at how this younger generation learns and how they consume information, how they like to make decisions. Um, how they view their career trajectory. And so we're fascinated by this. And we think there's a lot of potential um, for this um, um, generation to teach us and for them to teach them. And so we're hoping that it becomes, rather than us versus them, rather a dialogue. Because I think if we can create a learning environment in which the generations can really be speaking and understanding and learning from one another, mm -hmm. that's the best. So I want to turn this over to you. This is your chance to ask questions of two of the top wor world leaders on crisis leadership. So um, anyone have a question? And I know this is not a quiet group, so. Yes. I have a question. I, I really enjoyed oh, that. Oh, here, we'll, we'll wait for the microphone. Sure. There you go. 
And, and Wendy, sure. could you introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Wendy Walsh, and I'm the program manager for FEMA's Higher Education Program. And I love this notion of being active in that arc of time. And as I think about that as a tool, I haven't yet read the book, so I want to ask you, one of the things that makes it challenging for me to navigate or be active in the arc of time is my relationship with uncertainty. Whether I see uncertainty as rich with possibility or I see uncertainty as something I need to shift to knowledge and understanding. In your interviews or when you think about being it, was that something that came up, the uh, notion of comfortability or the relationship with uncertainty? So actually, that's a really good question because there were two bits, Wendy, that we pull together there. And pulling them together is both, it emphasizes the puzzle, however, it gives you a framework to understand the puzzle. And the two pieces that you talked about, first going back to what Eric said, um, we find that leaders are very quick to pretend that they know something that they don't know. And in part because people are asking them a question, like if you're mayor or governor, or president asks a question, you're going you're gonna to answer the question. And so people were rushing to pretend that they know something that they didn't actually know. Maybe it was based on speculation. Maybe a lot of it was based on anxiety. Like, what do you mean you don't know that? Or I can't acknowledge that I don't know that. So what they were doing was they were filling in the blanks. And as they filled in the blanks, they felt more comfortable. But eventually, they realized that they were making a lot of mistakes because they were basing their decisions on information that wasn't true or that informa information that changed. So part of the exercise that we went through about driving to the known is that leaders have to be really, really clear about what they don't know. And um, you only will drive to the known if you acknowledge that you don't know something, which is a little bit counterintuitive. Like the only way I can figure out that I've got to be asking a different set of questions if I acknowledge that I don't know something. Um, our brain doesn't necessarily like to do it because our brain tends to fill in the blanks when we don't know something because it helps us deal with that uncertainty and the anxiety of not knowing. So number one is to recognize that there's a lot that we don't know that may, might make us feel more anxious. However, it will make us a better leader because we're going to start asking questions about the unknowns. And when we do, we might get information that's counterintuitive or different than what we expected or pretended. And so that was the first thing. The second thing is that once you recognize that there's a lot that you don't know, all of a sudden you organize your arc of time along the lines of trying to get that inf pull that information in. So you acknowledge you don't know something. You acknowledge that it's going to take some time to get to know it, and that you're going to use that time to build your knowledge base and the knowledge base of other people. You only can recognize that if you see that time is something that you can work with. Like, I don't know it right now, but I will have the answer in six hours, is a way of acknowledging the unknown. And in six hours, the information that you have will be far more accurate and will be the basis for making good decisions. The information I have right now, inaccurate. If I make the decisions, they'll probably be wrong. And so what we found as we were going through our notes as we were observing leaders and then trying to understand this ourselves, is that if you see that this process happens over an arc of time, all of a sudden you can organize what you're doing, what is primary, what can wait a little bit, and you're not overloaded with, we have to do everything right now. And so you start organizing your thinking over this arc of time, and you start organizing other people's thinking over the arc of time. I mean, the Gulf oil spill was a great example. They couldn't plug that oil spill today. And I remember Secretary Napolitano was really frustrated with that, as were others, right? Right. But it was going to take time. And so once you start looking at time as something that you can see, manage, work with, all of a sudden that decision making and that information gathering process is completely different. You can manage it. And the best way to deal with the uncertainty and the anxiety is to feel there's something I can do with it. That's why we create it as a tool. Because if it's a tool and I can work with it, then I can advise my leaders, I can advise other people, I can inform myself that here's what we're going to do and it will emerge over this arc of time. The other good thing about the arc of time is it ends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the, you, know, you know, one of the problems for people is they feel I'm in a crisis that's going to go on for the rest of time. 
it, it's going to end. And um, it, it gets you starting to think about, oh, how do, how do we want to end this story? Like, what, what are we trying to achieve here? And all of a sudden, you start organizing a series of events, series of information, series of decisions over this arc of time that will, in some moments, be at a frenzy, because you're right in the middle of it, that will taper off, um, and that you can direct it, you can manage it, what's going to happen at each point. And that is a great way to deal with the uncertainty and the anxiety. So, so the 15 year olds, um, they are um, already have started to become leaders. Yes. Mm -hmm. So as you're working with the 15 year olds um, and younger people, how are they sorting out role models for leaders today? And maybe they're not at all. Maybe they're just trying to figure it out on the fly. Um, and I think um, back to uh, me being 15 year old, trying to figure out who my role model was. And it's pretty fi easy to figure out. And I think it's a little murkier today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think it's a lot murkier today. So how are they doing that? They, they divide the whole world into two. I mean, because they're young. They're talkers and they're doers. They don't much respect talkers. And so um, they, they want to see something done right now. So one of the things that Eden emphasized is that if the police had come in sooner and they had taken action, there were a number of people that were killed on the first floor where she was. There were seven people killed up on the third floor. She said if people had come in quicker, those seven people would have been alive. So they are very much oriented toward doing and I think, and then now let's step back and look at what happened after Parkland and what continues to happen for these younger people. They're very frustrated by the fact that, you know, they go to state legislators, they speak to leaders, they speak to elected officials, they speak to their parents, and everybody says, we really need gun control. It's really, really important. And so their question is, what are you doing? Not, not what you're saying, what are you doing? And they also, because they're very much, again, in a digital world, they do things. Now, you know, clicking on something or thumbing something for us might not feel like it's doing, but they're doing things. And so they're very much oriented toward what did you get done? What did you accomplish? How are things different? Not the long-term process of talking through it. That's, I yeah, I was going to say that they, um, perhaps because they're worrying about really big problems. I mean, they're very concerned with climate. Certainly, more than one person said to us, you know, I shouldn't have to go to school thinking I might die today. Right? This is not what a 15-year-old should be thinking about. They are impatient, and they really don't think that having a lot of meetings and writing long papers and creating an annex to the manual is doing anything. Now, I know in this town, that's a lot of livings people make. <laughs> right. um, you know, I've been, in, I've been in these policy meetings where you can see it's like it's on sort of a four-year cycle because I've got to keep my job until the next guy comes in. And that sort of, we, we wrote the big paper at the end of four years. We did something. Well, if it didn't change anything, these folks are saying, no, you didn't. You, you cut down some trees, and, and that's about it. So um, there is a certain impatience. And I think when you look particularly at the kids who came out of Parkland, they gave us a master class on how to lead. Whether you agree with what you know, all their policy positions or not, that's separate. But they, hey, here's a problem. We're the ones. We're not, our parents haven't done anything about it. Our Congress people haven't done anything about it. We're going to step up and try and do something about it. And you're going to listen to us. And, and they self-organized. They put themselves together. And they started taking action. And they re, it's, uh, it, it really is a master class in how to catalyze leadership. Introduce yourself, Brian. Uh, hi, I'm Brian Kamoy. I'm the Associate Administrator for Mission Support at FEMA. Um, so I want to pull the thread on catalyzing leadership because the example you gave uh, the Park Lawn uh, students, how do we do it outside of marquee crises? Because we get this window every time there is a crisis, of course, and we have an intention span in the public. But the news cycle is so fast, the event fades and everybody moves on to the next. What so, do we do in between to catalyze leadership? So. And here's a story that didn't get into the book, although I just told it in a piece that gets published next week. Um, I think, and the advice I've been giving to people ever since I first heard this, is get people to solve the problem that's in front of their face that they care about. And by doing that, you'll build the relationships that will let you then address the problem that, that you may, the people in this room are concerned about, but they, you can't get the energy to say, 
the next hurricane, the next whatever it happens to be. And that is from Joplin, Missouri. We all know the story, and Joplin came, responded really well. The community was resilient. The schools were open in nine months. And so I was at a conference, and I got to listen to a guy named C.J. Huff, who was the superintendent of schools. And in the middle of his presentation, because he's talking, and it, you know, talking about the students who died and the teachers who died, and he's tearing up, and we're tearing up, and it's like being on the Oprah show. In the middle of all that, he threw up a slide of this two-year resilience plan. And so I found him afterwards, and I said, that. I want to know about that. And so we, we spent an hour talking about it, and he said, before the tornado, we realized that the economy was changing in Joplin, and where for years you could get a high school education, you could go get a job at a factory, and they gave you enough to raise a family, buy a house, do your stuff. And that was, those jobs were going away. You had to do, kids couldn't drop out of high school anymore and, and do well. We had to fix the high school dropout problem. And so they, he convened people, bought some bagels and coffee, thought he'd get a dozen people, he got 175 from across the community. And he said, okay, this is great. You came for the bagels and coffee. If you want to embark on this process with us, we're going to take an eight-week education to understand why kids drop out. Domestic violence, drug abuse, nutrition, everything. We're going to really understand it. At the end of that, they came up with a, an approach that said, we as a community will meet the needs of any kid who thinks he or she is not going to drop out of school within 24 hours. You need shoes, we'll get you shoes. You need a place to stay, we'll get you a place to stay. Involved the traditional self social service agencies. They had some funding, and they put together this Facebook group. So again, if you needed you know, pair size 12 shoes, you put it up there, they got them. When the tornado hit, all the things they had put in place to support the high school dropouts flipped to support the people who were affected by the tornado. And they had built the relationships across the community. And if they had said, we're going to have a meeting to talk about tornadoes, nobody would have shown up. So I think we, as hmm. people in the field of, of disaster preparedness, need to find the problem with opioids, with flooding, whatever it is that people care about, build the relationships, getting them to solve that. And then you'll be able to mature them into the bigger, longer-term threats that we always have a hard time getting them to pay attention to. And, oh. and, and what Eric was talking about, uh, this is another piece for anyone who um, was in the NPLI two thir 2013 and earlier, um, we introduced this idea of swarm uh, leadership in 2014. Um, and so what Eric described is that in Joplin, they had built a swarm. It wasn't around a burning crisis. It was around the crisis of these young people. That swarm existed, and that swarm could adapt to a different kind of a crisis. And uh, in, in very short order, and I won't be a spoiler for the book, um, basically, we, what we've come to believe is that we being social beings, we have ways in which we connect with one another. Um, it's parental connections. Uh, it's connections uh, for a common purpose. Could be a faith-based organization. Not necessarily in a crisis. Some workplaces feel like they're swarms, um, you know, or, or, or um, sports teams feel like there's a swarms. I play a musical instrument, sometimes a band. People are really jiving with one another and it feels like a swarm. So you can build those swarms, and then at that moment the crisis hits, then you can deploy the swarm to do something that couldn't be done by individuals or that would be very hard to organize in the midst of a swarm, in the midst of a, a crisis. And people would ask us, because our aha about swarm came right after the Boston Marathon bombings, when we watched what happened in Boston, we watched how those leaders behaved and interacted with one another. So that was our aha. The downside of that is people think, oh, it could only happen in a crisis. And then we point out all of those day-to-day -day swarms that people are very mm -hmm. connected to. And we ask, well, what do the swarms accomplish? And what's the difference between a swarm? And then the flip side is suspicion, uh, where people are really working against one another. And once people recognize those distinctions and how that could apply and then be leveraged in a crisis, that's why it's important. It's not simply that the swarm will emerge in a crisis. Yeah. We had a question over here. Hi, Brooke Courtney, FDA. Um, without getting political, um, this administration has a number of acting leaders. And what are your perspectives on uh, leaders who are in acting roles and their levels of accountability or willingness to sort of step up to that role in, in particular during a crisis? You know, I, I think that anybody in an acting position, it is, I think it really is a challenge I, that 
but you have a decision to make. And I think back to when Rich Besser was acting director of the CDC. And one of the things he said was, I'm acting, I may only, they told me he was going to be there for what, eight, eight weeks and he was there for six months, um, was that he was going to act as if he was a permanent secretary. I mean, per permanent uh, head of the, the CDC, the administrator. He was going to just go ahead and begin to act as if it were his job. And then he would force step out. And I think that if we have more people, as we see there are a lot of actings across government, you have to be able to do that and step in and say, I'm, this is, I'm only acting, but it could be a whole long time here. I've got to begin to do that. But it's tough. I mean, you have to make that choice that you're going to be a, a caretaker or you're actually going to get in and try and lead and make something happen in, the, in whatever time you're there, be it six weeks or six months. So this, that's a really important question. And if, again, we had another chapter we could write, we're not going to do it. Uh, <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, it would be on some of the ambiguity uh, of being a leader. And what's interesting about this acting role uh, that Eric alluded to is different people will interpret it in very different ways. And in part, they'll interpret it in terms of just how they view themselves as a leader and what their responsibilities are. And then, of course, sometimes it gets interpreted in very political terms, um, that if they're an acting, it means they're more vulnerable, so they've got to be more politically allegiant. Um, and it all goes back to being true to yourself. And in this way, uh, in, in Eric's example, Rich Besser was true to himself. And he did an extraordinary job leading through the H1N1 crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we do sim see some of these acting leaders who are doing what their agency needs. They're saying things that are somewhat controversial. Um, and they're acting uh, on those beliefs. And there are other uh, leaders who are just using this as biding time uh, in this political environment. So those nuances are really, really interesting. I think that it's going to be hard to really understand what we're going through until after it's over. Mm -hmm. And we're right in the middle of the show. And so, um, and, and it's literally happening as we speak. Um, but it will be an interesting question to under, for all of us to, re to look back first on what did I do in those whatever number of years it was? Um, and what were the pressures on me? How did I respond when I was in a difficult situation? You know, we always tell people, hold a mirror to yourself and look at yourself as a leader. And how do you assess what you're doing, um, whether it be getting out of the basement or the difficult decisions that you're making? And I think all of us, one way or the other, are going through a significant challenge in these four years. And you learn more about leadership by just looking in the mirror than you can by reading a book. And you can quote me. <laughs> but, but, but still read the book. So right. you're going to sell mirrors right, now. Right. <laughs> yeah, we don't sell mirrors. Right. <laughs> it's got a little URED logo right on the bottom. Um, <laughs> but, but it's true. And I think we're all learning a lot about ourselves in these four years in ways that we hadn't expected. Um, and how well we are leading now will have a huge impact um, uh, uh, on the future for our country and for us as leaders as well. So your, your uh, discussion of mirrors uh, raises for me, how do you gain that self-awareness to actually recognize what's in the mirror without, an, uh, you know, we're speaking, speaking metaphorically? Yeah, so a, a lot of what we, we've taught at the NPLI mm -hmm. is about being able to have the emotional intelligence to be the person that's needed in the moment. One of the other favorite stories, uh, my favorite stories in the book is uh, Jimmy Dunn, who worked with Sand Sandler O'Neill. Sandler O'Neill. Um, he was one of three partners. Um, he was the tough guy. And uh, of course, uh, on 9 11, they were in the upper floors of one of mm -hmm. the towers. Uh, the two other uh, uh, partners who were leading the organization perished, as did a big portion of the company. Um, and so he uh, at, looked in the mirror and said, I need to no longer be the leader that I was, I need to be the leader that's needed in this moment. And so he looked at one of the leaders who wore suits and was very prim and proper, so he started wearing suits. Um, he looked at one of the other leaders who was more of the negotiator, so he started being the negotiator. And so he took on the role of those other leaders because what he said is, this is the leader needed in this moment. And he became that leader. Um, and so I think that that's part of what each of us needs to do in our own assessment of our leadership, 
whether it be in the middle of a crisis getting out of the basement, uh, whether it be helping other people to get um, out of the basement, um, or creating the connectivity of effort that's needed in the situation. So I think that being the leader that's needed in the moment is one of the themes of the book. And I think that's something that we have to ponder every day if we're leaders during times of change or crisis or when we're in the middle of uh, a larger societal change as we're experiencing right now. And you did ask how you do that, so I'm going to answer the question a little bit differently. <laughs> Since uh, you know B Barry Dorn is with us in spirit, if not in body, and at the end of every chapter are a series of journaling questions. And those of you who went through the NPLI with Barry know he's a big journaler. And I think part of how you develop that emotional intelligence and that self-awareness is to actually take time to reflect. And it's really hard because we all have very busy calendars, the phone's always dinging, there's stuff always going on, there's one more thing to do. Taking even 10 minutes a day to just reflect, capture your thoughts, write them down, think about what went well today, what didn't go so well today, what did I enjoy, what did I, when did I feel weak, when did I feel strong. Just a few minutes to jot those notes down is a way you begin to reflect back with yourself and, and build those muscles and begin to see what's in that mirror and what's looking back at you and how, and how to better understand it. I'm Annette Totten. I'm the director of the National Counterproliferation Center. One of the things that I find so valuable about MPLI is the diversity of participation that you built into the program. So from your perch, could you maybe share with us some key differences you see between government leaders and private sector types? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, because I, I, my, my background is from the private sector and I'm a late in life academic and got to meet all these good government folks, although my dad worked in government most of his career. Um, it's a different set of pressures and it, it, very, it is a very different way of looking at the world and not being stereotypical about it, but there are, um, you know, so I work with one of the big pu public companies in the oil sector quite a bit. They're, the public, the pressure every quarter to deliver financial returns is very real. It's tangible. It shows up in your paycheck whether you get there or not. Um, and the ability to make change in the private sector. If someone needs to go, they go. You don't just transfer them to the you know, least geographically uh, exciting office in the agency. No, they're gone. Um, and so that's the difference between civil service and, and employment of the private sector. Um, and there's still not a lot of understanding across, particularly I think when it comes to emergency management and preparedness issues that um, we see as people come through the program, a great appreciation develops of each other of, oh, wow, I didn't know you guys could do that and or you had those resources and wow, you can join with us here. Um, so there is a growing um, appreciation, I say, across the, the sectors. However, there is a diff a, not that government folks don't think and move fast, but it's just, you're thinking about policy, you're thinking, it's just a different pace to that world versus the business world. And again, I think a lot of what happens when you're in a government agency is going to stick longer if policy gets put in place or if uh, legal ramifications, those kinds of things, which is very, very different. And I think that the, the private side, they're not used to so many restrictions on what you can do or so many sort of mm. guideposts to which you have to adhere. Um, they have different ones. Sometimes you don't see theirs and they don't see yours, but it is a, it's a, I've been happy to see that people have gotten to be much more familiar with each other through the program and really understand how they can work together and make those two worlds complementary, not contradictory. How is, uh, uh, oh, I'll take this other question, but while, uh, let me just quickly, how is social media changing leadership? Let me check my phone and I'll tell you. <laughs> Um, I'll take that one too since I'm more on social media than Lenny and Lenny can weigh in afterwards. Right. Um, you know, I, I think it, and first of all, social media, we use the term, but it actually refers to a fragmented universe of Twitter is different than Facebook is different than Slack is different than uh, Instagram. There are different things and they, they, they behave differently. Um, but I do think in terms of leading, the biggest change is that people expect constant or instant feedback. They're used to that feedback loop happening. So there's not a lot of patience for you to think about it for three days to give people an answer to something. They're expecting more transparency because you're out there all uh, there in, in uh, giving answers. If they're going to put a question out, they're going to get an answer from somebody, whether it's you or, or, or not. 
Um, and it's also become a great distraction. So I think it is, um, you know, it consumes a lot of, of headspace sometimes. But I think in terms of our organizations and thinking through leading, it, the biggest implication for me is that need to be both transparent and fast and, and engage with people because they will, if they don't get an answer relatively quickly, they will go somewhere else. And I know now organizations, not Harvard, thank God, where people have to give uh, performance feedback via social media. And it's done sort of in real time. Like, I want to know today how did I do, not once a quarter, not once a year. But it's, a, it's, it's sort of a constant uh, thing, which I think can be both good because we actually engage with people more. On the other hand, it can be exhausting because you can't be doing performance reviews every 24 minutes. But. You know, one of the fascinating things is that as leaders, you'd like to control certain things, um, which goes back to the uncertainty that you, you mentioned, Wendy, and also goes back in that to the, the difference between um, government and, and the business sector. In the business sector, what we find is that uh, I know what I control, and I know what decisions I make, and I know what decisions I'm responsible for, and it's a little bit more concrete than in government where you're dealing with a very large policy environment. You've got your hierarchy that you're dealing with and the agendas uh, going up and the agendas going across. Um, and the same thing with social media, that um, in the good old days you could hold a press conference and that was pretty much what went out in terms of knowledge and information and news. And right now it's simply impossible to control the news cycle. And um, so. So leaders would like to have control of certain elements of what is happening in a crisis or during change. And uh, in part, social media and, um, and government, as opposed to the private sector, those control buttons are a little bit different. And um, that creates different kinds of frustrations for people. Uh, but it really goes back to the uncertainty question, um, that uh, social media has created more uncertainty because mm -hmm. we don't know what to believe and what not to believe. Um, um, the the um, political nature of government creates more uncertainty because it used to be that you'd put together a brief, the brief would be presented, it would be understood in certain ways, certain actions could be expected, and, and that was just the way things always went. And now things just don't go the way they always went, which means that you don't know exactly if I do X that it will have this kind of an impact. And I think that's why leadership is more important now than before. Um, because you still have to adapt, you still have to make decisions, and at the end of the day, you want a safe world. And it's just more difficult, and it's more perplexing, and it's more uncertain now than it was just a few years ago. And chances are it's only going to continue trending in this way, even if there's a change in the politics of the country. Um, I am wondering uh, about uh, the book and, and what your research in NPLI has told you about the ability to have inclusive discussions with you know, women, people of minority, access and functional needs, etc. What do you say to someone who doesn't necessarily feel like they're it um, in those um, leadership opportunities where they can step up but don't necessarily um, sort of have that confidence within them? Well, can I tell you another one of my favorite stories? Uh, okay, so, um, so this uh, book is in part a reflection of our experience teaching the NPLI, but we teach students at Harvard as well, um, which is a different generation. And uh, so we have a, every year in January, we take a week and we, we're with our master's level students. And it's a very different kind of a class that we organize for them. So. Um, they start on a Monday morning, and Monday after lunch, they have to give a speech as if they're the lead leading highest government official in whatever they do in their place of origin, where they're from. So if you're from Delaware, you're the public health commissioner in Delaware, whatever it might be. So, um, so we gave that assignment, and as soon as we broke, um, a woman stood up and came up to me and said uh, about this assignment to be the highest public official in her um, jurisdiction, she said, I'm very offended by your assignment. And I said, well, why? She said, well, because her name is Dr. Soraya Dali. And she says, because I'm from Afghanistan, and you're asking me to be the Minister of Health in Afghanistan. And I'm a woman in a Muslim country, and that could never be. So how can you expect me to do that? And 
Well, I said, well, sorry, I give it a try. I mean, you know, just try it out. So uh, that afternoon, uh, Soraya got up and she gave a speech. And it was, by everybody in the room's assessment, a really mediocre speech. Her heart wasn't in it. Uh, she was trying to talk about the health of people in Afghanistan. And she couldn't quite articulate what the problem was. She didn't have a notion of what the solution might be. So then on Friday of the same week, um, at the end of the class, the students also, again, have to give a speech. And they have to identify this time. They have to say who they are. They can be anybody. They have to say what the nature of the speech is. And it's up to them. So uh, on Friday, so now this is five days later, uh, Soraya, Dr. Dolly, got up. And a student has to introduce who they are and what the purpose is. And she said, my name is Dr. Soraya Dolly, and I am the Minister of Health in Afghanistan. She gave the most powerful speech about, here are our health care problems in this country. Here's what we need to do in order to resolve them. And if we do, this will be the impact on the health of people in our country, and we could get it done. People stood up and gave her a standing ovation. It was such a moving speech. Um, so Soraya, who was very angry that I would suggest that she would be in a leadership role in her country, at graduation it was announced that she had been selected to be the Deputy Minister of Health for Afghanistan, and she was going to go to her back home to assume that role. And then three years later, when the Minister of Health moved on, she was selected as the Minister of Health for Afghanistan. And uh, Soraya had a very a, a hands-on way of leading, so she believed in presence. So when there were health problems or where there were terrorist attacks in Afghanistan, she felt that she needed to be on scene. And so one of the unique things is that she would go to see how it affected people and what her ministry needed to do, and she would make sure it got done. And then eventually she was uh, selected as a permanent representative to the United Nations. So on that score, uh, whether it's a woman or a young person or someone from another religion or culture, um, we believe that people should rise and, and be the leader needed in the moment. And Soraya certainly did it uh, with all of those uh, points against her and extraordinary courage and tenacity and persistence because she really believed in her mission and she was able to accomplish it. All right, we have time for one more uh, question. Uh, here in the front row, you had a question uh, <laughs> as we absorb that inspiration. Mm -hmm. That was an amazing was story. Very great story. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and it's tied a little to my question because when I read, I saw the book You're It on social media and I was like, you're it. Well, Lenny's talked about the swarm and all this. What about were it? Then I saw the matchstick and I thought maybe you're it. You're supposed to ignite the were it. But I wanted to ask you about that title. And I know you asked about the title, but in terms of collective leadership and thoughts on that, how do we inspire that? And where is it the kind of the threshold between the individual you're it and the acknowledgement of the diversity and the inclusion and the were it? So um, I'm not a Talmudic scholar, um, though I've studied with some. <laughs> and, and what they will do is they will take a word, and they can spend many hours just analyzing a particular word. You're not going to do that, are you? No. OK. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we were yeah. tired. Time is running out. Yeah. So I will, in a, in a moment, say that the word you actually has many different meanings. And so you all came here today, and that's plural. And and the only way that a meta leader can be successful is by creating the collective you. Um, and that takes a great deal of wisdom as well. First to see that there's a collective you, and then to create the conditions in which that collective you happens. It means it's not all about me. It's not about my ego and me being in charge. It's about you and what you're able to accomplish. So yes, you have that responsibility as a leader to create the you collection. And um, it's that double meaning that we want to um, represent the tension of what it means to be a leader. It's not all about you. It's all about you. And yet, it, you still have the responsibility. And that um, as a meta leader, you're constantly living in that tension. Because you have to take the responsibility. You also have to turn the responsibility over to other people and then make them the leader as well. 
great note to end on. So please, uh, let's give a big round uh, for these two fabulous leaders for teaching us.